Hello, everyone. This is Kevin Xu, the founder of the Interconnected newsletter on interconnected.blog, which is a newsletter on the intersection of tech, business, geopolitics, and investment. And this is also the newsletter's YouTube channel that you're listening to right now. Today's video or audio is another narration of one of our most recent popular articles called What Does Databricks Do? This was written by Sean, one of our guest contributors. He is currently an early engineer at Ascend.io and got his master's in human computer interaction at Carnegie Mellon. He also wrote a bunch of amazing posts on Interconnected on the landscape of low code, no code, which also has a narration on our YouTube channel. Make sure you check those out. All right, let's get into this post called What Does Databricks Do? Type Databricks into Google, and you will likely see the first few suggested entries being IPO, careers, and valuation. That's enough to suggest a massive hype around this big data unicorn, the same kind of hype seen with Robinhood recently, or a few years back with Uber and Airbnb. However, unlike the sharing economy and fintech, Databricks' products and core business remain known to only a small community of VCs, data scientists, and nerdy engineers like me. So this article, or this narration of this article, serves to help more people, engineer or not, navigate Databricks, a relatively low-key unicorn. To do that, I won't jump straight into the technical weeds of Spark and Delta, but will instead begin with a high-level view of the broader big data landscape to explain how Databricks fits into the big picture and where it's headed. Now, let's talk about big data in 30 seconds. While the big data market is a $100 billion beast with double-digit year-over-year growth, it really boils down to three key questions, two fundamental concepts, and one common goal, or the holy grail. Now, the three questions are, what is the data, whether it's system-generated data, commercial data, or user data? What to do with the data? whether it's business intelligence, analytics, machine learning, or dashboarding. And lastly, how to move data from A to B, which is ETL, meaning extract, transform, load, and its many variants. The answer to each question has room for a dozen different solutions. Each solution has enough market demand and commercial interest to support numerous public companies. Now, what are the two fundamentals? The first one is storage meaning data persisted to a physical disk, either on-premise or in the cloud. The second is compute, renting a server to perform some computational tasks on the stored data. Compute is usually where most of the money is spent, meaning that keeping servers up and running is significantly more expensive than allocating physical space on disks to store data. There are also other areas of spending, like networking but that's less relevant in our discussion about Databricks and big data. What is the one holy grail? The one common goal that every company wants to achieve with their data is an automated journey that takes raw data sets and turns them into business value. In the pre-web days, where most of our data could sit comfortably in Excel spreadsheets, this was easy. Just deploy a VBS script with several functions, and that will suffice. Now we're drowning in a gazillion YouTube video watch events, start, pause, skip ads, etc., being collected, parsed, aggregated, and eventually turned into one single dashboard. And all of this happens on an hourly basis. A thousand path. While the end goal is common, there are literally a thousand paths to reach this holy grail. Every SaaS or open source company operating in the big data domain falls into one or many parts of this data journey. While the cloud giants like AWS, Azure, and GCP are all attempting to build an all-in-one service, there's plenty of room for smaller vendors with creative solutions to find a foothold, grow, and become a giant themselves. Databricks is one of these examples. To appreciate how vast the big data landscape has grown to become, I find the VC Mac Turk's landscape graphic quite handy, and it is updated yearly. 
Over just the last few years, not only has the number of companies in each category grown, but new clusters of solutions are also popping up to form subcategories. So, what does Databricks do? If you're confused by the tagline on Databricks' homepage, which says, all your data, analytics, and AI in one lake house platform, you're not alone. But with the big picture I just laid out in mind, let's see if we can make some sense out of this tagline and the company itself. In essence, Databricks is a compute company that presents a low-code solution to pursue the holy grail by answering two out of the three key questions, what to do with the data and how to move data from A to B. Why does answering these two questions make Databricks a valuable company? An analogy that may help illustrate this point is the more well-known example of Arduino, an open source electronic prototyping platform. Imagine you are tasked to build an FM radio with a bunch of electronic components. It's daunting, at least if you're like me with little hands-on hardware building experience. That daunting feeling is what engineers feel when building the data journey with variable software components renting virtual machines from AWS and writing Python scripts to compute on some datasets, you'll soon run into roadblocks, like how to coordinate multiple machines to parallelize the process, how to handle machines that go rogue and lose connections. Arduino made prototyping and building digital devices easy. Instead of starting from switches and circuit breakers, the platform provided three important offerings to appeal to non-hardware engineers. One, a higher level language that packages up useful functions to control the Arduino board. Two, an ecosystem based on the breadboards where modules can be easily pushed into the sockets to facilitate rapid prototyping. And three, a feasible path from turning Arduino prototypes into production ready hardware. If you think Arduino's platform is powerful, then it's not hard to see how Databricks is also powerful, because it also offers three core building blocks, but for big data. The first building block is Apache Spark, which is an open source engine abstracting away the complexity of working with distributed computing. Spark makes the task of taking one petabyte of data stored in a thousand machines and multiplying a column of each individual record by two, while at the same time staying resilient to random machine outages, as simple as a simple command. This command is the same as if you were to do the same task on a single machine. Spark handles all the underlying complexities and only surfaces the higher level functions, packaged in Python, Scala, and SQL. The founders of Databricks, who are a bunch of so-called Berkeley hippies, as CEO Ali Goshi calls themselves, were the original creators of Spark. These hippies live and breathe distributed computing. The second component is Notebooks, which is a plug-and-play environment to prototype with data. Consider Notebook as the breadboard, an interface to get quick feedback when working with unfamiliar datasets. Each cell in a notebook can run a few lines of code and show results instantly much like an inserted Arduino component that performs some tasks. Notebooks are not unique to Databricks. It's a common interface to many data scientists and analysts. Jupyter Notebook is another popular solution. Yet, when Spark is combined with Databricks' notebooks, a data scientist gets superpower. These notebooks, by default, are connected to an enormous amount of distributed computing power via Spark, thus can run calculations on really big data sets, something a single machine cannot achieve. As it turns out, connecting notebook to underlying computing resources at scale is a non-trivial engineering workload. It's the type of work that Databricks' core users, mostly data scientists and analysts, find boring and burdensome. In many companies, these are the same people who are in charge of discovering the data holy grail. Much like people who use Arduino, they rarely have a complete design in mind to begin with. Their work is a lot of prototyping and trial and error, whether it's cleaning the data or training a machine learning model. Databricks comes in at the right moment 
to provide them with a familiar notebook interface, plus the distributed computing superpower to make working with big data easy. You may recall my earlier post on local no code and the core value proposition of these products, freeing engineers from low impact programming, Databricks tells a perfect low code story with its plug and play notebook offering for data scientists and analysts. The last component is jobs, a pathway from development to production. Now we have a dozen notebook cells prototyped and functioning, what now? We don't want to manually run each cell whenever there is new data coming in. Also to bring down prototyping cost, we typically only bring in a subset of data to work against, not the entire data set. Databricks takes a genius approach by offering a feature called job. A job grabs a working notebook and runs it on a user-defined schedule with an auto-scaling mechanism so it can work with the full data set in production. This significantly cuts down the time required to take a working prototype from development to production. The power of Spark really comes into play here. The same code can seamlessly transition from handling a few gigabytes of data on a few machines to processing many petabytes of data across thousands of machines. How does Databricks make money? Like I mentioned, Databricks is a compute company. Like other companies in the category, it makes money by keeping service up for customers. It's worth noting that Databricks does not own any of these servers. Instead, the whole system is built upon the infrastructure of the major cloud providers, like AWS, Azure, and GCP. For Databricks users, their bills largely break down into two parts. The cost of keeping these machines up and running, charged by underlying cloud provider, and the so-called add-on functionalities, like notebooks and jobs, that Databricks provide on top of these machines. Both types of costs are charged on an hourly basis, a strictly pay-as-you-go model. Databricks is not the only company building on the shoulders of the cloud giants. The other well-known player and fierce competitors of Databricks, Snowflake, also employs a similar approach. Snowflake's easy-to-use cloud data warehouse is backed by the same set of cloud infrastructure building blocks. Is it possible for capable engineers to use the same building blocks like AWS EC2, S3, to build an in-house version of Databricks to reduce cost? Certainly possible, but it's likely not worth it, at least not until this company reaches a certain scale. Going back to our all-code versus low-code discussion, just because you could build something doesn't mean you should. Databricks offers features like cluster auto-hibernation, sharing, and permission management to convince users that paying Databricks is better money spent than the voting engineering hours to build and maintain something similar in-house. Now let's get back to Databricks' tagline, all your data, analytics, and AI on one lake house platform. By now, I hope this tagline is starting to make a little bit more sense. Databricks is basically trying to own the entire data chain, which means more data, more machines, more servers to keep running, and more money for the company. Of course, Databricks customers give value by not having to do any of this work themselves. Looking at Databricks' roadmap, it isn't hard to notice its ambition to expand beyond just a notebook company. While data scientists and analysts love notebooks and don't mind paying for the low-code premium, data engineers are a different breed. They work closer to the data sources and are responsible for data ingestion, maintaining infrastructure, and performance tuning. These engineers value flexibility and don't mind writing some extra code to get the job done the way they like it. Data engineers work on the earlier phases of the data journey, which also happen to be compute intensive and costly. In other words, a good source of revenue. To win them over, Databricks' solution is to invest more in open source, namely by introducing Data Lake, which is an open source storage layer. Open sourcing gives these engineers the much needed flexibility to exert control over data governance, movement, and reliability. 
And while anyone can use the dot delta format with any solution, not just Databricks' solution, it is supported out of the box in Databricks notebooks. Combining that with features like LiveTable, the whole platform seeks to win over even the most hardcore data engineers by providing observability and tunability. In the long run, getting all the data personas, engineers, scientists, analysts working on the same platform is tremendously valuable in obtaining the data holy grail. The shared context, visibility, and collaboration lead to more agile organizations and faster product life cycles. Databricks wants all of these personas to live in the same quote-unquote lake house. It's not quite there yet, it's still building this house, but for an eight-year-old company, it's making impressive progress.